Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled The Promise, God's Everlasting Covenant. And this lesson, entitled Covenant Faith, is for uh, June 19 of 2021. It's lesson number 12 in this series. As always, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we need to understand more clearly what covenant faith really is. Why is faith seems like it's a part of every important statement about you? How could that be? What is faith? What do we need to know about it? Help us to learn about you today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, questions for us to think about during this lesson. Is salvation a gift? Is faith a gift? Where does it come from? Is God our only source of true faith? Why does God consider faith so important? Why did Paul suggest in Acts 16, 31, let's look at that. Remember, Paul and Silas had been singing in that Philippian prison, and then there was that earthquake, and they, everybody in the prison was released, and the jailer was going to kill himself because he was... It was his responsibility to make sure that nobody escaped. And they said, oh, no, 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 don't kill yourself. And so he rushed inside and said, what's, go what's been going on here? And Paul said to him, what? Paul and Silas, they answered, believe in the Lord Jesus. So what's another word for believe? Have faith. Have faith. Any, any other? Trust. Persuasion. Persuasion. And some other words, but those are the ideas. Have faith or trust in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your family. You mean I don't have to do the 27 doctrines? I don't have to do what? To have faith. That's all I have to have? Well, let's see if we can figure out what that's all about. Uh, if faith comes from God, how does God give it to us? After we interact with God and He gives us faith, do we have it? Or does He just credit us with it in an account somewhere in heaven? What does faith have to do with the life and death of Jesus Christ? Let us never forget that the questions and accusations against God had to be answered by evidence from God himself that was Jesus Christ. Why does God want to save us? Wouldn't it be better for him to just eliminate all of us? In what sense is this world a testing place for the plan of salvation? What is our role? and the great controversy. And what is the role of the law in all of that? Did Jesus somehow meet the requirements of the law on our behalf? Uh, what would that mean? When men and women can more fully comprehend the magnitude of the great sacrifice which was made by the majesty of heaven and dying in man's stead, then will the plan of salvation be magnified and reflections of Calvary will awaken tender, sacred, and lively emotions in the Christian heart, Christian's heart. Praises to God and the Lamb will be in their hearts and upon their lips. Pride and self-esteem cannot flourish in the hearts that keep fresh in memory the scenes of Calvary. All the riches of the world are not of sufficient value to redeem one perishing soul. Who can measure the love Christ felt for a lost world as he hung, on the hung upon the cross, suffering for the sins of, the guilt of guilty men? This love was immeasurable, infinite. Christ has shown that his love was stronger than death. He was accomplishing man's salvation, and although he had the most fearful conflict with the powers of darkness, yet amid it all, his love grew stronger and stronger. He endured of hiding his father's countenance until he was led to exclaim in the bitterness of his soul, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? His arm brought salvation. The price was paid to purchase the redemption of man, who, when, in the last soul struggle, the blessed words were uttered which seemed to resound to creation, it is finished. The scenes of Calvary call for the deepest emotion. Upon this subject, you will be excusable if you manifest enthusiasm. That Christ, so excellent, so innocent, should suffer such a painful death, bearing the weight of the sins of the world, our thoughts and imaginations can never fully comprehend. 
the length, the breadth, the height, the depth of such amazing love we cannot fathom. The contemplation of the matchless depths of a Savior's love should fill the mind, touch and melt the soul, refine and elevate the affections, and completely transform the whole character. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, 212 and 213. So, if our souls have been transformed through contemplation of the love of God, does that suggest that there is a real change in us? Carrie? I'm reading from uh, chapter 6, verse 15 of Galatians. As for me, however, I will boast only about the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. For by means of his cross, the world is dead to me, and I am dead to the world. That's a good news translation of the Bible. Okay. Try to imagine how that statement sounded. And let, 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 let me just emphasize a couple points there. I will boast only about the cross. Think about that. Now I'm going to read your comment. Try to imagine how that statement sounded to the people to whom Paul was writing. The cross was supposed to be the most humiliating possible form of death used on those who were regarded as traitors to the Roman government. And Paul is boasting of the cross. I mean, is there something wrong with your mind, man? Wouldn't that sound like that initially? Okay. From Gordon? the New Revised Standard Version, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. Okay. So what did Peter men when, mean when he said we were ransomed? In contrast, Christ ransomed us from the slavery of sin and its final fruit, which is death, but he did it with his precious blood. This is from our adult Bible study guide again. He did it with his precious blood, his substitutionary and voluntary death on Calvary. Again, this is the foundation of all the covenants. Without it, the covenant becomes null and void because God could not have justly fulfilled his end of the deal, which is the gift of eternal life bestowed upon all who believe. God could not? Could we have a statement suggesting that God could not? I think God could do anything he wants, right? Nope. Can't force you to love. Wow. Okay. Why is that? Was it because God was incapable of fulfilling his end of the deal? Or was he just unwilling to do so? The truth is that Jesus demonstrated the truth about God, his character, his love, and how he chooses to run his government on love. No one else could answer the questions that have been raised by Satan in the great controversy. No one else could refute Satan's accusations against God. Satan's accusations were against God himself, and thus they must be answered by God himself. Notice what Paul and John have told us about sin, its results, and the results of having a true relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, Jim, I guess that... Okay. Romans 6, 23, For sin pays its wage, death, but God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus our Lord. Good News Bible. 1 John 5, 11 to 13. The testimony is this. God has given us eternal life, and that life has its source in his Son. Whoever has the Son has this life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I am writing this to you so that you may know that you have eternal life, you that believe in the Son of God. So, how do you understand the following words? This is from our Bible study guide. Carrie? Only someone who is equal to God himself, in whom life exists unborrowed and underived and eternal, could have paid the ransom required to free us from the debt owed to the law. 
This is how all the covenant promises are fulfilled. This is how we have the promise of eternal life. Even now, this is how we have been ransomed from sin and death. That's from the Sabbath School Study Guide. Okay. Oh, we owe a debt to the law? I mean, that is pure paganism. I hate to use the word pure in, in that context. It, it's just, uh, it's terrible. We, we have, uh, We're sinners. sinners. So you disagree with that statement? I absolutely uh, agree, disagree with that statement. Uh, dear. We're sinners and we deserve to die. Sin pays its wages death. Yeah. So that's what it should say. So who decided how serious this debt was? And what should be paid? I mean, does God have a bank account that has a ledger in heaven and deciding how much death needs to be poured on Jesus? Well, in Scripture, Abraham was regarded as the ultimate example of faith. Jim? I'm, I'm, that's yes, Gordon. Gordon. I, that's Gordon. Genesis 15, 6. Abram put his trust in the Lord, and because of this, the Lord was pleased with him and accepted him. Okay, it's still calling him Abram. So what does that mean to us? It was early on. Yeah. Early in his life, right? Was it foolish for Abraham to believe God's promise? Or we should say Abram. God's promise of, well, no, this is talking about later in his life. Was it foolish for Abraham to believe God's promise of a son by Sarah when Abraham was 100 and when Sarah was 90 and past having children? Was that foolish? Well, I seem to think so. Does the ability to believe outlandish things which are promised by God mean that we have real faith? What was Abraham credited with, accounted as righteous? Or why was Abraham credited with, accounted as righteous? Was it true that even under very difficult circumstances, which seemed impossible, he did what was right in obedience to God's commands? Well, was it, wasn't Abraham called from... Or from, from his homeland? Yes. Wasn't that part of his Abraham showing some yeah. faith and belief that, and, and trust in, in uh, the Creator? We're going to talk more about that in a moment. Yeah. What actually saves us? If righteousness is, righteousness is by faith, and justification is by faith, and sanctification is by faith, clearly it is faith that is the key. So what exactly is that, that the role of faith? And how is it imputed, look at that word, imputed to us? Does God declare us righteous when we aren't really? Would that be a the theological lie? Was Abraham really the friend of God or wasn't he? After his sin with Bathsheba, David wrote two psalms that speak about these issues. Paul referred to David's words in Romans 4, 1 through 8. And I quote, what shall we say then of Abraham, the father of our race? What was his experience? If he was put right with God by the things he did, he would have something to boast about. But not in God's sight. The scripture says Abraham believed God, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. Those who work are paid wages, but they are not regarded as a gift. They are something that has been earned. But those who depend on faith not on deeds, and who believe in the God who declares the guilty to be innocent, it is this faith that God takes into account in order to put them right with himself. So if you believe crazy things, is that what we're talking about? Well, this is what David meant when he spoke of the happiness of the person whom God accepts as righteous, apart from anything that that person does. These are words quoted from David, Happy are those whose wrongs are forgiven, whose sins are pardoned. And this is one of the two chapters that we know were written by David just after his sin with Bathsheba. Happy is the person whose sins the Lord will not keep account of. Okay? Looking again at Genesis 15, 6, we can see that various translations have rendered the term as counted. This is for the Hebrew chashab or reckoned, or credited, different versions, or accounted. The same term is, term is employed in other texts in the books of Moses. A person or a thing is reckoned or regarded as something that that person or thing is not. For instance, 
In Genesis 31, 15, Rachel and Leah affirmed, affirmed that their father reckons or regards or counts them as strangers, although they are his daughters. The title, I'm sorry, the tithe of the Levite is reckoned, regarded, or counted as if it were the corn of the threshing floor, although it is obviously not the corn. Now, I had to read that several times before I could figure out. So, how does this work? Do you remember how this tithing of, for the, from the Levites worked? The children of Israel were supposed to pay a tenth of their increase. That tenth of their increase is supposed to go where? to the tribe of Levi, right? Uh, yes. And then the tribe of Levi were supposed to turn around and give a tenth of what they received. They hadn't raised it themselves. They got it as a gift from somebody else. They gave a tenth of what they received to the family of Aaron, the high priest. If you go back to the, the original place, it explain, explains all of that. So here's a case where they're, in effect, handing on corn that they got from somebody else, but they're treating it as if it's their corn. So the Bible, the Bible study guide is trying to tell us there are other cases in the Bible where things are declared to be something when they really aren't. Is that the truth about faith? Well, do you agree with the following statement from our Bible study guide? Gordon? God is accounted the sinner as God is accounting the sinner as righteous, although the individual is actually unrighteous. It's from Wednesday. Is that the way faith works? I, I thought that faith was, no, uh, according to the kid, knowing something is true that you know ain't true. Yeah. The small kid who comes home from Sunday school and mom asked him what faith was and says, faith is believing what you know ain't so. <laughs> Can a truth-telling, we're going to take these words very seriously. Can a truth-telling God who gave us the ninth commandment about telling the truth really look at us and call us righteous? Would that be a lie? Well, it could be that you're pointed in the right direction. God could see that, mm -hmm. understands human nature, and uh, from that point of view, it's not a stretch. Okay, now we're going to look at a couple contrasting versions of faith. Jim, I'm going to ask you to take this next one. This great truth, that of being declared righteous, is not because of any act that we can do, but only because of faith in what Christ has done for us. Is the same, excuse me, yes. is the essence of the phrase righteousness by faith. Yet, it is not that our faith makes us righteous. Rather, faith is the vehicle by which we obtain the gift of righteousness. This, in essence, is the beauty, the mystery, and the glory of Christianity. All that we believe has, as Christians, as followers of Christ, find an important root in this wonderful concept. Now I'm going to interrupt there. Okay, faith is the vehicle by which we obtain the gift of righteousness. What does that mean? You're supposed to know what this means, right? It's dark speech. It's, a, this, it's just a mouthful of uh, syllables strung together. Okay, all that we believe as Christians, as followers of Christ, finds an important root in this wonderful concept. Okay, go ahead. Through faith, we are accounted righteous in the sight of God. All else that follows obedience, sanctification, Education, holiness, character development, love stems from this crucial truth. There again, that's an opinion by the adult Bible study guide. So are we really changed by faith? If we'd use the word persuasion instead of faith, I remember there's a famous uh, radio uh, personality some years ago or some time ago. He says, I don't want to convince somebody I want to persuade, and then they will have come to understand the, the point of view on their own. Mm -hmm. That's what and Jesus said, the Word. Jesus communicated through words, mm -hmm. and he, that's education. It's a process. It's not some magic uh, turn of, a, yeah. of events. That Okay, we've looked at this passage before, but see if it sounds like these people have been changed. Carrie? 
are we really changed by faith? All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ, and if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. The will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience. Now I'm going to interrupt there for a second. Does that sound like a little change from the average person living on the world today? A life of continual obedience? Sure. And obedience, if you understand that the, that word comes from a willingness to listen. Mm -hmm. And that is a process of education. Mm -hmm. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. And that's from Ellen G. White, The Desire of Ages, page 668, paragraph 3. Now, it doesn't say that you have to be like that the next day after you give your, your, yourself to Christ. It doesn't say that's going to be in the first month or the first six months or the first year. God has a goal for us. We're working toward it. And God, what God says, what God wants to see is progress. That's what he wants to see is progress. Are we making progress in the right direction? We're either moving closer to God or moving farther away from him. Which is it? So we are left with one great question. How are we to get the righteousness of Christ? Does it become ours? And up there in the quotation, you notice that it said, Christ will so, um, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Who's doing that for us? Christ is. Trying to educate us. Mm -hmm. And let this mind be in you as yeah. it is Christ Jesus. That's a process of education. It's, it's relatively simple. We just have to keep repeating it because that isn't what so much of uh, theology is about. So we are left with one great question. How are we to get the righteousness of Christ? Does it become ours? Or is it just credited to us? 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that by beholding we become changed. Is that really true? Gordon? Romans 5.1 and uh, the question, what does justification have to do with peace? Romans 5.1, now that we have been put right with God through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We might have, maybe someday, perhaps, we have. We have. We've been changed. So how does faith accomplish that fantastic transformation? What can we actually do to strengthen our faith? The only thing we can do to strengthen our relationship with God is to improve our faith. What is faith? As we have noted before, based on all of Scripture, a biblical definition of faith stated so well so many times by one of God's best modern friends, Dr. A. Graham Maxwell, is as follows. Jim, you want to take that for us? Faith is just a word we use to describe a relationship with God as with a person well known. The better we know him, the better relationship may be. We cannot say will be because we remember the story of Lucifer, because we remember the, excuse me, Faith implies an attitude toward, toward God of love, trust, and deepest admiration. It means having enough confidence in God based on the moral, is it more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing, excuse me, more than adequate evidence revealed to be willing to believe that he says, as soon as we are sure he is the one saying it, to accept that we offers, excuse me, what he except offers. that, except, what, except he what he offers, as soon as we are sure that he is the one offering it, and do do so, and to, and do, to do what he wishes, as soon as we are sure, he is the one wishing it, without reservation for the rest of eternity, anyone who has such faith would be perfectly safe to save. This is why faith is the only requirement for heaven. 
And what's the verse for that? Do you remember we mentioned earlier? Acts 16, verse 31. Okay, go ahead. Faith also means like Abraham, that is in Genesis 18, verses 22 to 33, and in Job, Job 42, 7 and 8, and Moses, Exodus 32, 5, excuse me, to 14, and Numbers 14, 11 to 25. God's friends, we know well, well enough to reverently ask him, why? The sentence in brackets was also stated parenthetically many times by Dr. Maxwell. Job and Bible citations in brackets are added. Okay, so we are saying that <laughs> faith is just a word we use. And it's a word used to describe our relationship with God. Romans 14, 23 says to us, faith, uh, anyone who, do who doubts when he, when he drinks, he's talking about, um, and he eats, talking about eating meat offered to idols. Um, I should, let me just read that. I was reading about whether I should read it when I said that. Look at Romans 14, 20. I'm, yeah, Romans 14, 20. Three. I'll pop that up here for us in just a second. But if they have doubts about what they eat, God condemns them when they eat it because their action is not based on faith. That's what we're talking about here. And anything that is not based on faith is sin. 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 So we have, a, we have a conflict here. Sin leads us away from God and faith leads us toward God. Toward God is faith. Away from God is sin. Okay? And notice these words from, from Ellen White. The only way in which he, the sinner, can attain to righteousness is through faith. By faith he can bring to God the merits of Christ and the Lord. And that's a, that's a little bit of a dark speech there. Basically it says that we, by beholding we become changed. We can become, we can literally become like Jesus. He wants us to become like him. He's willing to help us so we can bring to God the merits of Christ. And the Lord places the obedience of his son to the sinner's account. Christ's righteousness is accepted in place of man's failure. And God receives, pardons, justifies the repentant, believing soul, treats him as though, notice that expression, treats him as though, he were righteous and loves him as he loves his son. Now, it doesn't say uh, God is judging him as if he's righteous or whatever. He treats us as if we're righteous and he loves us as he loves his son. This is how faith is accounted righteousness. And the pardoned soul goes on from grace to grace, from light to greater light. Selected messages, Ellen White, book one, 367, paragraph one. So God treats us as though we were righteous. Does that mean he, he doesn't know we're not righteous? He doesn't th try to win through intimidation. No. He's, he's a, a teacher. Jesus came as a teacher and not a penalty payer. Carrie, would you take that next quote for us? Yes. <clears throat> when through repentance and faith we accept Christ as our Savior, the Lord pardons our sins and remits the penalty prescribed for the transgression of the law. The sinner then stands before God as a just, in brackets, righteous person. He is taken into favor with heaven and through the Spirit has fellowship with the Father and the Son. Then there is yet another work to be accomplished, and this is of a progressive nature. The soul is to be sanctified through the truth, and this also is accomplished through faith, for it is only by the grace of Christ which we receive through faith that the character can be transformed. From Ellen White's Selected Messages, Book 3, 191, Paragraph 2 to 3. Now, I like those paragraphs for several reasons, because it talks about several things that faith does. This also is accomplished through faith. What is this accomplished through faith? We gradually are transformed to become more like him. For it is only by the grace of Christ which we receive through faith. So how do we receive the grace of Christ? 
through faith that the character can be left as it is, no, can be transformed. So what happens when Christ comes into our lives? We just go on with our sins? No, we're changed. We still do need to remember that faith works. James 2, 17 and 18. So it is with faith, if it is alone and includes no actions, then it is dead. But someone will say, one person has faith, another has actions. My answer is, show me how anyone can have faith without actions. I will show you my faith by my actions. Good News Bible. Now you know that uh, it's statements like that that made Martin Luther want to throw James out because he thought everything was all about faith and faith only. But Faith uh, alone. Yes. Faith and you want to read for us Romans 16, 26 there? No. However, that truth has been brought out into the open through the writings of the prophets, and by the command of the eternal God it is made known to all nations, so that all may believe and obey. Good News Bible, Romans 16, 26. But if we are saved because of something that happens in the books of heaven, something that is credited to us, couldn't God just credit everyone and save all of us? Would that be possible? If. If it's only bookkeeping. Yeah, if it's only bookkeeping. If, it's if only it doesn't require change on our part. Right. It's so, hard to wonder how God is, the universe is going to run for eternity. Yeah. Are you going to have carry on just what's going down on in this earth? Or is there going to be a change of, of, of mind, yeah. a change of thinking? Is if we understand there's not going to be prisons and courts and yeah. policemen and all that, how do you, the only way you can do that is with people that are not self-centered. People who want you to do cannot, right because it is right. Yeah, but you can't have self-centered people no. and, 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 and have a, a, a peace. Mm -hmm. It does not work. Well, so what is the meaning of substitution in this whole process? No matter what we do, our human nature is sinful and unworthy in comparison to the purity of God's righteousness. Okay, well, hopefully we'd all agree with that. By accepting Christ's substitutionary death for us through the covenant, we can stand worthy in the sight of God. And however, now we can stand worthy in the sight of God. That means we are worthy or we're not worthy. And however much God cleanses us, changes us, molds us into reflections of his image, we must always have Jesus as our perfect substitute. This is the essence of the gospel and our great hope, our, co our covenantal hope. A adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 158. Is that now, again dark speech? Well, I remember that last week we talked, to, we, we looked at a quotation that said, Jesus came to represent the Father. That was the whole purpose of his coming. And that was Ellen White saying that. That was Ellen White's words. And, and he had the reason he came to represent the Father because the character of the Father had been besmirched. Yeah. It, yeah. it, was, it was messed up. It wasn't the truth had not, had not been told. Yeah. Our Bible study guides suggest that in order for the New Covenant to be ratified, Blood had to be shed. Who said that? Why must blood be shed in order to have a covenant? That was a pagan way of doing things way back. Jim? Their plight is serious indeed. They cannot cleanse themselves of sin, Proverbs 20, verse 9. And no deeds of law will ever enable them to stand before God justified, Romans 3.20 and Galatians 2.16. Hence, the atonement to be accomplished for sins, sinners that needs to be done had to be made through someone else in their behalf. Christ is utter self-giving even in death. He is the means of our return to God. Through him we have access to the Father, Ephesians 2.18. In essence, to me, to access to be appropriate. An ac to be, and an, access. Yeah, an access to be appropriated by faith, Ephesians 3, 12. 
faith, excuse me, faith in him whom God put forth as an expiation by his blood to be received by faith, Romans 3.25. Now that is all made up. That is, okay. it's in the Bible, but it's not in the Greek. Okay, Romans 3.25, it asks us to look at. Let's look at that again. Romans 3.25 and 26 are supposed to tell us how righteousness is received by faith. Okay, Carrie? Continuing, God offered him so that by his blood... There's blood. Now let's, let's be sure. The Bible talks about that. And what does the blood stand for? In the footnote? The footnote is uh, chapter 3, 25 to 26. By his blood or by his sacrificial death. Okay. It should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven through their faith in him. God did this in order to demonstrate that he is righteous. Why did he do this? To pay the price for our sins? Nope. To demonstrate that he is righteous, that he, wow. God, is righteous. Okay, go ahead. In the past, he was patient and overlooked people's sins. But now, let's talk about that a second. What does it mean to say in the past he overlooked men's former sins? Can you think of a very specific example of that? What does it say in Genesis 2, 17? In the day you eat of it, you will die. And Adam and Eve died right there, right? No. <laughs> but they began to, death is a process that began there. Okay. But here's a case where God did what? Overlook people's sins. Right? Go ahead. And it was actually, when he stated that, it wasn't a threat. No. It was just a warning of how things work. Statement or, or of fact. And an attempt to educate them mm -hmm. what, how things work. But in the present time, he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. Okay. In this way, God shows that he himself is righteous and that he puts right everyone who believes in Jesus. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay. Why is it? that Paul wants to say three times to demonstrate God's righteousness before he finally says, oh, by the way, he also makes righteous everyone who believes in Jesus. Several times we use that term Jesus dealing with sin. Mm -hmm. uh, but I always wish that we could bring it out. And that is in uh, Hebrews 9, 20, 28. Well, you can go back to 27. And just as it is appointed for men to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to heal, or the word save in the RSV. Okay. So again, that emphasizes what we read earlier from Romans 8.3. The first time he came was for what purpose? To deal with sin. To deal with sin. Okay. To educate. Yeah. But when he's come back, he will. Often people regard the Old Testament as a time of great legalism. But Genesis 15, 6 tells us that Abraham, or Abram, before he became Abraham, was a quintessential example of faith. How could that possibly be? Okay, Gordon, I think you're next. How amazing. This is from the Bible study guide at Adult Teacher South School. How amazing that the Old Testament, often viewed as the ultimate example of what legalism is all about, is really the foundational expression of the covenant promise of salvation by faith. Let me interrupt for a second. Now, legalism is a term that gets bandied about and, and, and thrown about uh, in Christian groups to mean what? What is legalism? Well, technically, it's you follow the law. Okay, and what's the purpose of following the law if you're a legalist? To uh, obtain salvation, to, to win salvation. Your, exactly, to win salvation earn or to earn it. your salvation. So legalists are people who believe that if they carefully, diligently follow the law. I think Maxwell used the term, those that are preoccupied yeah. with their legal standing. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Okay. The example of legalism is all about is really the foundational expression of the covenant promise of salvation by faith. 
Okay, go ahead. Back in Genesis 15, 6, we can see this in the famous verse, quote, and he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness from the New King James Version. This, of course, in talking about Abram, not yet Abraham, the Hebrew is clear. Abram believed in the Lord. That is, he not only believed that he existed, but he also believed his promises, even the ones that seemed impossible, such as that he would one day father a great nation. Okay, I'm going to interrupt there again. His faith, believe in what you know ain't so. That's what the little kid said as he came home from Sunday school. Ooh, wh okay. or was it Sabbath school? Mm, good question. Well, uh, did God make other promises that seem impossible? What about other promises of God that seem impossible, such as that we, those sinners, can be accounted righteous and even made righteous in his sight? Talk about belief in the impossible. Okay. Adult teachers have a school Bible study guide. Okay. Famous preachers and the theologians in the past have made some fantastic statements about faith. Here's an interesting one from a very famous preacher. Quote, faith eats her manna and leaves not a morsel for worms to breed in. What is that talking about? The giving of the manna on the trek, trek to Palestine, right? The faith of Abraham could lead strings of camels and flocks of sheep away from Haran to Canaan. His was the faith which could drive the tent pin into a foreign soil or roll up the canvas. And I always try to remind people, you know, often we think, oh, faith, there was Abraham and he, he had uh, some, a few helpers maybe and, and uh, his wife and, and then finally a couple of sons. He had, a, he had an army of 318 soldiers just to protect his flocks. I, who knows how many shepherds he had? Ellen White says one time he had a, more than a thousand souls in his family, his larger family, and he tr he treated he trained them yeah. how how to be faithful followers of God. He was conducting a school. He was. Yes. It is a practical, active living, weekday, everyday faith. It will speak very broadly and plainly and say we need a bread and cheese faith, a faith which believes that God who feeds the ravens will send us our daily bread, a faith that does not live in the region of fiction. And that's from the famous ancient Charles preacher Charles Spurgeon in his book Spurgeon's Expository Encyclopedia. And it's quoted in our Bible, Teacher's Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. So when it comes down to punch time, what has God risked? Jim, you want to help us there? How can divinity risk so much in behalf of humanity? How uh, can God... Now, that you know that most of our Christian friends would say, I'm sorry, but I just have to interrupt here. Most of our Christian friends would say, God is way up there. There is nothing that we can do that would, would affect him whatsoever. But is that true? Go ahead. How can God declare completeness, that is perfection, for people who, though in process, have not fully attained? How can he declare as accepted persons who by nature are unacceptable? How can the Godhead ask their reputation? The Godhead risk. Risk their reputation by extending such daring grace. The answer is threefold. First, God does not become, does so because he accepts our sincere prayers and affords okay. efforts towards spiritual maturity as perfection. God sees this, excuse me, sees that as progress. Okay, I'm going to interrupt again. So what's God looking for? He, he knows he's not going to find a bunch of perfectly saintly people like Jesus here and he's just going to come and take us to heaven. What, is, what does he see in us? He sees growth and progress. And potential. he knows, potential. he knows, yeah, potential. He knows what the long-term result is going to be. <clears throat> you need, want to be, see us heading in the right direction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
Second, Christ is able to take such action because the faith that he sees in us is not <coughs> ours really. It is his. He sees his faith in us and honors that faith. It is ours in that we are repositories of his love, the objects of his grace. But it is his because saving faith is of divine, not human origin. Now I'm going to interrupt again. So what is faith, what is God seeing in us here? He can see the direction of our life and then okay. the choices that we've made. He can see us beginning to behave like Jesus, right? Beginning to behave like Jesus. By beholding, we are being changed. Okay, that's the second step. Third, God acts with such confidence because in the final analysis, it is not on us that the Father focuses. It is on the righteousness of Christ, robe that covers us, Calvin Rock. Well, there again, that's a lot of dark speech again. Okay, but let's, let's see if we can explain this in meaningful ways. So God looks at us, and now let's, let's think about, it. we talked about the judgment in, our, in our last week's lesson. We said, what's happening there? We stand before the, the universe, they're all watching. Satan is standing there, and what's he doing? He's accusing us. He's the accuser of the brothers and sisters. What does Jesus do? Does he say, oh yes, that's fine, no problem. I guess you must be right, let him die. What does Jesus do? He turns around and he accuses who? Satan. Satan. He says, you don't, you, you know, you're, you're trying to make this person look, I mean, this is, you know, a typical court scene. You're trying to make this person look as bad as possible. But I know for a fact that he's really like this. And then he talks about the good side. See, that's a defense lawyer. That's the work of Jesus. So it's that that God looks at. Because that's the behavior which has made us now gradually changed us to become like Jesus. Now, it's behavior that we are involved in, ideas and attitudes and thinkings that are part of our ideas and thinking, but where does it come from? It comes from God. Where do we learn it? We learned it from God. Who is the example we have to look at too? Jesus. I mean, okay, all of this raises the question that is so often asked, are you saved? Can we get a definite answer to that? We give a definite answer to that? To save or salvation are words from the Greek word sozo, or sozo as they would say. Sozo is a verb. And what does it mean? Remember that the word sozo, or to save, in Greek also means to heal. So what is happening to us as we gradually take time to let Jesus have a part of our lives, to let the Holy Spirit work in us, to be transformed, to be changed. What do we call, what does God call that? Healing. 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 Huh. Be focused. Okay. Gordon, I think you're next. From the Teacher's Bible Study Guide, again. Different faiths view salvation in different ways. The Baptists place salvation in the past. It is an event that took place at the cross. All sins were forgiven at that point. People who believe in predestination put salvation at the, quote, holy council, end quote, where certain people were appointed to be saved or lost. Roman Catholics place salvation in the future, after a person who dies believing in Jesus is purified in purgatory. These are punctilinear, punctiliar, I'm sorry, views of salvation, meaning that salvation takes place at one point in time. Seventh-day Adventists, however, have a linear view of salvation. Salvation has a past, present, and a future. It is a process, a series of divine acts and human responses. Again, from the Bible's okay. guide. Now, there's a pretty good quotation, I would say. We have suggested that already. Faith works with us. Faith is our, re our relationship with God. And as we exercise that relationship with God, as we, as we think about Him, as we, th we read about Him, as we observe in the Bible what He has done, what happens to us? 
we gradually, by beholding, we become changed. If you wonder how that by beholding become changed works, watch small children and their parents. Yes, yeah. Well, that last paragraph that you read there, that's really a, a somewhat descriptive of, of it wanting. Yes. To bring in harmony with, with his everything. Yeah. It, it's, it's not a bad statement that they've got there, but I think the, a better definition would, it's at one, to bring into harmony a to, at one moment. In light of all that God has Question. done, yes. Do you think that the Baptists and the Calvinists and the Catholics would agree with the short descriptions that were given of their faith? Well, I don't like their salvation. Too, the, 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 the summary if, is not too bad. If you, if you, you boil it down, well? Huh? Yeah, we agree. Do you think yeah. they would agree? They would agree that those are the that that's the basic point right there. They would lot of, they would like to add a lot of definitions and other things around the edges, but that's really what they say they believe. Also, they, they, a lot of that is based upon a misunderstanding of, of, of what the Colossians two fourteen. Yeah, a, a, mis, a mistranslation or a misunderstanding. In light of the of all that God has done for us under the watchful eye of the entire universe. Remember, God's government is totally transparent. What have we been told about God's attitudes toward human beings? If we were to cherish an habitual impression that God sees and hears all that we do and say and keeps a faithful record of our words and actions and that we must meet it all, we would fear to sin. God is watching every moment of every day, every person's life. Let the young ever remember that wherever they are and in what, whatever they do, they are in the presence of God. Hold on just a minute. Weren't we taught when we were younger that if you go to a movie theater, the angels stay outside? Hmm. Does, does God doesn't need to watch? I mean, he, he <laughs> knows, he knows his human nature. I mean, it, 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 this is... <laughs> we cannot hide our ways from the Most High. Human laws, though sometimes severe, are often transgressed without detection, and hence with impunity. But not so with the law of God. The deepest midnight is no cover for the guilty one. He may think himself alone, but to every deed there is an unseen witness. The very motives of his heart are open to divine inspection. Every act Every word, every thought is as distinctly marked as though there were only one person in the whole world and the attention of heaven were centered upon him. Patriarchs and Prophets 218 and 217 and 218. So, how clearly does God see us? As if the entire universe was just looking at us. Here's another point. In the parable, the shepherd goes out to search for one sheep, the very least that can be numbered. So if there had been but one lost soul, one lost soul, Christ would have died for that one. Christ topic lessons 187 and found in some other places. We should feel the responsibilities that rest upon us as Christians and labor as though we realize the value of our souls, remembering that the one soul saved in the kingdom of God is worth more than 10,000 worlds like this. Review and Herald, Ellen White, April 1, 1880. Wow. Paul used Abraham as a great example of faith. Look at Romans 4, 1 to 4. Jim? What shall we say then of Abraham, the father of our race? What was his experience? If he was put right with God by the things he did, he would have something to boast about, but not in God's sight. The scripture says Abraham believed God, and the, because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. Those who work, excuse me, those who work are paid wages, but they are not regarded as a gift. They are something that has been earned. Good News Bible. Look back at Genesis 17, 17. How did Abraham respond to the promise of a son by Sarah? Carrie, you want to read that one for us? Yes, Genesis 17, verse 17. Abraham bowed down with his face touching the ground, but he began to laugh when he thought, can a man have a child when he is 100 years old? Can Sarah have a child at 90? That's a good news Bible. So God declares Abraham righteous 
And how does Abraham <laughs> respond? <laughs> he laughs. Does that sound like a great example of faith? Consider the following from Ellen White's morning talk to ministers at the General Conference held in November 1883 in Battle Creek, Michigan. And yeah, we'll have time, I think. God does not give us up because of our sins. We may make mistakes and grieve his spirit, but when we repent and come to him with contrite hearts, he will not turn us away. There are hindrances to be removed. Wrong feelings have been cherished, and there have been pride, self-sufficiency, impatience, and murmurings. All these separate us from God. Sins must be confessed. There must be a deeper work of grace in the heart. Those who feel weak and discouraged may become strong men of God and do noble work for the Master. Okay. So, Ken, what does all this le lesson say to us? Okay, what this lesson says to us in contrasting things is some people think that the process of salvation is a whole process by which God does something in the books of heaven. That he, he, you know, we're not really changed, but in our records in heaven, maybe our record, some people have described it as our record is wiped clean. Okay? But these verses, I hope, make it pretty clear that God does his writing where? In, the heart. in our hearts and in our minds. The change must take place in us. He's not taking a bunch of people to heaven who just pretend to be righteous or just who pretend to be, to sit, to be faithful. God looks at us, he pays attention to us, he thinks about us, and he watches what we're doing. And he knows that there are some who will take him seriously, will allow his Holy Spirit to work in their minds and hearts, and they will become changed. And those who are willing to become changed, God says, there's a person who's willing to learn. There's a person who's willing to listen. And if they're willing to learn and listen, it's safe for me to take them to heaven. They will continue to learn like we read the quotation we read there. Jesus will lead us beside the river of life and teach us what we did not understand while still here on this earth. I think it's time for us to begin this process of salvation, which will go on forever and ever. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have come together to talk about your word, to think about these lessons that have been given to us. May our thoughts lead us back to you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.